Our um, next guest has traveled um, 24 hours in flying time plus um, stopovers uh, to be with us. He started working on a presentation to deliver at this summit to uh, wake us up a little bit, I think, um, way back in, um, in November. Um, real pleasure to welcome onto the stage, please join me, Jim. Um, Jim McNamara, Professor of Public Communication, University of Technology, Sydney. Right, a few words about Jim. What hasn't he been successful at? Um, a journalist, successful PR man, then established the Asia-Pacific franchise of media of the media analysis firm Karma, Karma International, sorry, which he ran for or headed for 10 years, and then went into teaching for one very good reason. He figured that with a 30-year track record in um, PR, analysis, and um, journalism, of course, he was um, entirely qualified to help other young people with communication skills. Jim. Thank you, Barry. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, all of you. Um, Yes, with a build-up like that, one is always a little bit uh, cautious. Uh, I did start writing a, a paper back in November because I thought what I wanted to do was reflect on sort of 30 years. So I'm going to be quite broad. I'll move through a lot of territory, but let me say up front, my, uh, full printed paper is going to be available to you to critique and take away uh, as, as you will. Um, the search for public relations measurement and evaluation um, really goes back to the beginning of the 20th century when you, when you look at the records, right to the birth of modern PR. Um, even longer, according to some reviews, such as uh, by Tom Watson, who, who's written a history uh, on PR measurement. Um, so it's intriguing that we've actually been on this quest for a century. That's somewhat sobering, I think. Um, Watson noted that particularly since the 1970s, there's been intensive focus uh, on finding solutions in measurement and evaluation. Um, but um, while giving due credit to those who've uh, devoted themselves to this quest and there has been enormous progress made, I'm reminded of a very popular saying about philosophy, and that is, it's a bit like searching for a black cat in a coal cellar at midnight without a light. Um, because 2013 marked the 30th anniversary of uh, Emeritus Professor Jim Grunig's famous cri de coeur, his cry from the heart, when in 1983 he said he felt like a fundamentalist minister, uh, except for instead of railing against sin, he was railing for evaluation. But he said, most public relations people I talk to are for evaluation, but people keep on sinning and PR people keep on not doing evaluation. And, of course, he wasn't talking about the people in his room. We were talking about practice generally. 2014 uh, is the anniversary of the International Public Relations Association Gold Paper on Evaluation, uh, which was quite significant and related to this body in a way because it was the first global rallying call by the industry uh, to really focus on measurement and evaluation. Uh, and I'm old. I was uh, one of the co-authors of that Gold Paper in 1994. And in my naivety, I thought we'd have all the answers by now. Just the year before, I completed uh, a Master of Arts by research into measuring uh, one of the early studies of measuring the impact of PR. In the following year, as Barry alluded to, I set up the Asia Pacific Office of Karma International um, and then spent a decade actually doing this or trying to do it in the field. I believed uh, somewhat naively then I was going to become exceedingly rich because uh, John Pavlik said back in 1987 that measurement is the holy grail of public relations. So I was quite excited. Well, that didn't happen, I have to say, uh, getting the rich bit. But it was interesting because I certainly learned a lot in that sort of following decade or 15 years. And, and I think by the time I, I, I sold Karma International, I think we, had, we could agree we've all made, despite a few mentions of it this morning, we have all made some considerable progress. But despite that progress, which is really what I want to talk about today, uh, we still face a situation that we've, we, we can't say we've really cracked the measurement and evaluation nut. And this is something that still intrigues me. Um, David Michelson and uh, Dave Donald Stacks concluded as recently as 2011, and I quote, that PR practitioners have consistently failed to achieve consensus on basic evaluation measures and how to conduct the underlying research. The uh, European Communication Monitor in 2012 reported that 75% of European practitioners identified 
in quotes again, uh, forgive me for referring to my notes, the inability to prove the impact of communication activities on organisational goals is the largest single, single largest barrier facing the industry. Um, earlier this year, I wrote um, a review of the development of standards so far, which caused a little bit of a, a ripple. But very importantly in that article, I did commend the initiatives so far, and I very, very strongly support those. But in being totally honest and frank, we have to recognise that there are still inconsistencies, still gaps that remain. Uh, and I won't go through these in great detail today, but a few examples um, is that we have, in popular usage, 30 or more metrics used for measuring public relations. Now, I strongly support my colleagues who say that there is no single silver bullet. I agree with that. But the sort of plethora of met metrics that we see being used uh, hardly creates standardisation and understanding, and particularly when a preponderance of them relate to fairly basic output level uh, measurement. Uh, we still have um, many differing definitions of them. Um, and I, without going through too much detail here, I'll pick on, uh, with due respect to my colleagues who drafted some of these, reach and impressions, because we see here um, the number of people, the number of times an item was displayed, the number of possible exposures. They are all from different definitions that are currently in existence, all up to date, including the third edition of the dictionary on measurement. They are three very different things. I think you'd agree. So, that's interesting. Engagement. Um, we still see engagement uh, in both the advertising industry and the public relations sector being often described in quite superficial ways as click-throughs, uh, likes, following, etc. And I know lots of politicians, uh, as my previous speaker left, I can say this, lots of politicians who get lots of likes, but they don't actually mean likes. <laughs> People are just following to have a look at what they're saying. Um, and so we things like engagement has a deep body of literature in psychology and in democratic political theory that we could draw on, but we're currently not doing that. Uh, ROI, um, the Dublin Summit of 2012, uh, very appropriately recommended that ROI, in quotes, should be strictly limited to measurable financial impact when this occurs. Um, nevertheless, the search for a, a, a sort of a magical ROI goes on. And in my review, I managed to find 10 ROI or quasi-ROI formulas, ranging from, uh, you know, these that you can see on screen, ROI and ROTI and ROEM and ROE. Goodness, it's no wonder some of our senior management are confused. Um, meanwhile, um, a number of the measures that are available and some of the formulas and systems that exist are not widely taken up. And this I just choose benefit-cost ratio as an economic uh, formula that was developed as early as 1992. In, in the first excellence study. Cost effective and uh, effectiveness analysis, which Fraser Likely in the US talks about, market mix modeling, logic models, which I've used to connect PR results to organizational outcomes, communication performance management and communication controlling that Ansgar Zerfass champions in Germany. Um, these are all systems around, although I do have some concerns about the word control uh, and the quantitative focus on some of these, which I'm, I'm gonna come back to today. Also, as far as I'm aware, the March to Standards has not yet engaged with the, some of the reporting bodies like the International Integrated Reporting Council. Um, I don't know if Rob Flaherty is still in the room, but Rob this morning mentioned uh, relationship capital. And interestingly, the, uh, the latest version of the Integrated Reporting Framework specifically does now acknowledge social capital and relationship capital as part of the intangible assets of a corporation. So. Um, what I'm suggesting here simply is commending the work so far, but I wrote an article recently in the Measurement Standard that says we're on a long march, and I think there is still some way to go. And I think AMIC will lead the way in that. But I want to go a step further today and sort of say that even if we continue to refine these standards, um, two big questions to me arise. The first one is, why is it, you know, don't you wonder at times, why is it that after all this time and all this work, that we've done, that we still seem to be struggling to find, find these answers. And then secondly, if there are answers, how can we break this deadlock? Because there clearly to me seems to be a deadlock given the time lag that I'm talking about. Now these are hard questions and I, I'm not gonna pretend I have all the answers, but today what I'll try and do fairly quickly is uh, shed, some, shed some light on them. I'd like to address some very broad issues about human knowledge and research methods and how we go about gathering data. Um, 
And I then want to pose three barriers to you, three barriers that I don't think have been overcome and I'm looking beyond the usual suspects of lack of money and lack of time, and then drawing those together, talk about another potential approach, a slightly different approach and a model to evaluation that might be, that might be useful. Now let me launch a, um, a response to the dilemma that I'm outlining here, this deadlock, um, with a brief and quite quick summary of sort of Western history. Because buried deep in our, in our belief systems and in our psyche today, uh, are the, you know, are the, are the products of the Renaissance uh, and the so-called Enlightenment. And this was a period, of course, following the so-called Dark Ages, after the fall of Rome in 476 BCE and the Middle Ages. What was important about that is we saw a huge shift in how human knowledge was produced. I did say I was going to start broad, so, but bear with me, there's a point here. Commencing with the Renaissance in the 1300s and through into the 17th century, and escalating in the period referred to the Enlightenment in the 18th century, Western societies made a very profound shift from knowledge based on tradition, based on spiritualism, based on mysticism, even superstition, and on religion, to science. And that was a characteristic part of that. In fact, science you can identify as the central locus of the revolution that took place right across the Western world uh, between the 14th and 18th centuries that led to the Industrial Revolution and also then led on to the creation of modernism. Now, the key characteristic of science and scientific knowledge, of course, is that it's based on observable data and hard evidence, as we like to call it, and it uses deduction and rational, logical reasoning. In particular, what's relevant to us here today, the scientific method relies on quantitative research and the language of science is numbers. And we've heard a lot about metrics and analytics today. Modernist scientists seeking what Stephen Coleman from Leeds University calls, in quotes, the seeming unassailable aura of scientificity has become obsessed with numbers for classification, compilation, and quantification. And then along comes social science, which while being concerned with social issues and society, follows the focus on scientific methods of research. So early psychology, um, right behind, early psychology, early sociology, uh, even parts of anthropology relied primarily initially on demographic data and in some cases on scientific experiments using chemicals and electricity uh, to identify and try and understand how humans thought and how humans behave. Now, I'm not in any way anti-science, I want to say that, but this, this shift from spiritualism and mysticism and black magic and other primitive belief systems um, certainly is to be welcomed. In most aspects of our life, it has brought huge progress, and I don't think any of us today would want to live without our medical science, our computer science, our agricultural science, and so forth. And so, let me say clearly, there is a role, a huge role for science and for numbers. But a corollary of the rise in the celebration of science and the social scientific knowledge in the modern world has been a lessened focus, a much reduced focus, on a third major approach to human knowledge, the humanities, the humanistic approach. While acknowledging that numbers have a, a rigor and a logic about them, another writer who I really admire very much, John Durham Peters, says that numbers have, in quotes, a serene indifference to the world of human beings. What Coleman Peters and many others uh, are talking about, uh, and critics of modernism are talking about, are three things about, about uh, about science. First of all, the reductionist processes of science that limit knowledge to certain kinds of data. The notion of commensurability, which is a belief that everything can be reduced to a metric. And thirdly, the under underpinning scientific claim that the scientific method is based on objectivity and is achieved through detachment. Scientific research actually says that it's conducted from, in quotes, a dispassionate perspective, detached from all subjectivity and emotion. And I put it to you, therein is the greatest limitation of science when you're talking about humans. Quantitative methodology dominates the research landscape generally. And it's certainly inherent in the dominant paradigm of public relations. For example, uh, the leading PR industry research organization, the IPR, its tagline is the science beneath the art. So we recognize the art, but we're looking for that science underneath it clearly indicating a view that the principles of scientific knowledge and quantitative methods of research should dominate. 
what I'm doing today is without denigrating in any way science, I want to challenge this domination, not to weaken PR and corporate communication, but to liberate them from a narrow perspective of data and of knowledge based on the quantitative uh, scientific approach and paradigm. Postmodernism, which emerged as an intellectual movement in the second half of the 20th century, involves a number of philosophical shifts, some of which are fairly contentious, but a central agreed element is a re-recognition and a refocusing on human interpretation and perception and relationships. We've all um, probably heard and used the phrase, perception is reality. But in our modernist focus on science and quantitative data, we very often ignore the, the fact that reality is constructed of perceptions, attitudes, beliefs, emotions and feelings as much as it is with stone, minerals, turned into metals, bricks and so forth. And as a very simple illustration, think about what makes your home your home. How many of you would describe it in terms of its architectural work and its construction? How many of you would discuss it in terms of its geographic borders as a country? Or is your home something much more that reality? So when we look at human communication and practices such as public relations, it strikes me that we need to recognize that the outtakes and outcomes range across a number of things. Um, as much as it's a stepping stone, as Alex said this morning, awareness. Not only quantitative awareness, but qualitative awareness, how we, how we are aware of things. Perceptions, sorry, went one too far. Perceptions, attitudes, opinion, which can be the same as attitudes largely, but they can be expressed, whereas attitudes may remain latent. Engagement, we've heard all these concepts this morning. Engagement, trust, loyalty, relationships, and of course, behavior. But my point is that even a cursory review of these outtakes that are very common in communication are primarily human interpretations and perceptions. They are not independently and objectively observable scientific phenomena. Even observable behaviors are heavily influenced by interpretation and affective as well as cognitive processing. That is to say, interpretations and feelings are based on emotion as well as logical, rational, rational reasoning. They are subjective as well as objective occasionally. They are socially, culturally, and contextually constructed, not scientific facts. They are infinitely variable and diverse, not stable phenomena. CO2 plus water always equals a formula. Humans don't work that way. They are humanistic, those outtakes not scientific. They are largely qualitative and often not quantitative. Yet we try to measure these outtakes and outcomes searching for scientific methods and quantitative data. Let me give you a practical demonstration to illustrate this point. Uh, you're going to do a practical exercise now. Think about the relationship that you have that's most important, the closest relationship you have in the world. Your wife, your husband, your partner, your child. Think about that relationship just for a second. Now I want you to write down a score out of 100 or a financial value of that relationship. <laughs> uh, hang on, this is the relationship you know best in the world. You may have spent many years in this relationship. If you can evaluate human feelings, emotions, relationships in financial terms or even in any form of numeric terms, you should be able to write it down fairly easily. Okay, if you can't write down the value, maybe you need time, write down the scientific formula that you would use. Having trouble? Now the point of this simple demonstration is that human interactions, relationships, feelings, attitudes, loyalties, trust, perception, engagement do not yield easily and sometimes not at all to numeric quantification. So that's one of the reasons we're having some troubles in trying to do that. Not everything can be explained in scientific terms. Now, of course, it is true, I have to concede, that we could, if you wanted to, get into a conversation about love being chemical in the human body, hormones and reactions, but I don't really think if you went home to tell your loved one that you measured the relationship in terms of chemical changes in the body that he or she would really feel that truly valued the relationship. Now, it's understandable, of course, I'm the first to admit that it's very understandable that we we would want to, we yearn for the certainty that science and modernism promises. And of course, many in senior management who are educated primarily in the hard sciences, in quotes, mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, and their derivative disciplines like economics, accounting, and so on, 
hold to their faith in science and quantitative methods. But when, when applied as the way to understand human interaction, human thinking and human, human behaviour, science alone does not have all the answers. And not a, this is not me saying, this is now something increasingly recognised by medical practitioners, by scientists themselves. I'm working with leading medical practitioners in the UK and the US who are saying what's missing in medicine, their science is brilliant, but what's missing is they don't understand people. Here you are in this room, you work in the people business. Don't head in the wrong direction, running off to science for your answers. They may be under your nose. In focusing predominantly on quantitative research, it strikes me that, and looking for numbers, it strikes me that we're trying to measure air with a ruler. Contrasting scientific quantitative research, of course, postmodernist approaches apply interpretive uh, qualitative research to try to understand perceptions and attitudes and opinions. And contrary to what some people think, qualitative research is not an easier form of research. Qu quantitative research produces lovely averages, ratings, pretty charts, don't they? Pretty charts that look good in the marketing meetings. But when we get down to some of the very complex issues about understanding and gaining what we're talking about today, insights, insights and understandings of humans, we need qualitative research. Qu someone said to me, and I love this phrase, quantitative research is reading a temperature gauge and a barometer to describe the weather. Qualitative research is going out in it. And so I come back to the practical problem at hand, measuring and evaluating PR, having identified hopefully the first major barrier that I see, a predominant focus on quantitative research and a lack of focus on qualitative research as a key barrier. But if we don't have just numbers, then what do we have? So to move on, I want to quickly mention two more uh, barriers that I see to the, uh, to, the, to the challenge in PR measurement. The first one of these barriers is that we frequently conflate measurement and evaluation. And I'm thinking you know this, even when we talk about it, we usually say measurement and evaluation, don't we? And we write measurement and evaluation. In fact, I did a study of all the writing that I could find in professional journals and mostly it either described them in the same breath or as two things done concurrently or as a single conjoined linear process um, as, sim as, uh, as symbolized in this diagram. Um, now, I think there's two things fundamentally wrong with this. First, evaluation that's fused onto or conducted concurrently with measurement is focused exclusively on the metrics collected in the measurement process. We call that endogenous data, the data you've got inside the organisation, your own data. And I'm going to come back to that. It doesn't consider other information and context that might be available. But secondly, and even more fundamentally, while, while these things are related, measurement and evaluation are two very different processes. Measurement, of course, is the taking of measures. It involves two stages, data collection and data analysis. Carefully, I'm using the word data analysis. I want to return to analysis in a moment. Now, evaluation is defined in both the uh, Oxford and the Merriam-Webster dictionaries as to judge, make a judgment about the value of something. Now, of course, it's linked to metrics, but the point is value is a perception. If you don't believe me, again, think about your house or your home. When uh, real estate agents talk about the value of a property or the price of a property, they look up all the recent sales in the area, right? They look at all the data they've got available and they put a figure on it. But we know that the value of a property is what the people living in it believe it's worth or the people wanting to buy it and it's often a very, very different figure. So to me, that's important. Value is a perception. Measurement is a technical process. The third major barrier um, to, de to demonstrating the value of PR and corporate communication, as has been said this morning, of course, is that measurement and evaluation typically and traditionally look backwards um, at what has been done in the past. Some early findings from the measurement um, are looped back into the tactical planning of the campaign and of course the end results are usually looped back but mainly for planning the next stage of the campaign or, or the next part of communication. In most cases measurement and evaluation fail to give an organisation and its stakeholders anything other than a retrospective performance review. And sp I spent a lot of time recently talking to senior executives, the, the customers of measurement, and what they often say is that measurement and evaluation is often seen as little more than an exercise in post-rationalisation and self-justification at its worst. Perhaps unfair, but that's their perception. So, 
with all that background, three barriers, the conflation of measurement and evaluation, focus on qualitative, looking backwards, what should we do? And so what I'd like to do then is build on that and sort of introduce a new, a new approach to, to looking at it. Now, measurement and evaluation obviously has to begin with measurement. So there's no collection of that. And I totally support all the comments made about the importance of metrics and data uh, and so forth. Um, in addition, though, I'm arguing that it should not only be collecting data as, as described as metrics. Remember, data, data can be text. Data can be words. Data can be music. Data can be images. So we have a very narrow view of data. Collect quantitative information. Collect qualitative information. But the second thing I want to add on to this model that's very important is I want to split measurement and evaluation apart. And I'm going to blow them apart with two stages in between and one done much later than the first. And the first thing I'm putting in there is that measurement should be followed by a stage of in-depth analysis, not just data analysis, in-depth analysis. What am I talking about? Well, this sort of analysis certainly will draw on all the metrics that you may have. It may even draw on big data. But it can also draw on published research literature. It can draw on databases. It can draw on case studies. It can draw on theories and models of best practice. It can engage, use what academics call critical analysis. But probably more relevant in the marketplace, it can use market analysis, competitor analysis, business analysis. It is a detailed phase of analysis. And what this does is it provides a deeper, richer data pool including big data, if you want to bring that in, but including a lot of exogenous data, whether they're case studies or whether they're competitive findings, etc. It gives us this much, much deeper, richer uh, field of, of data. Now, this deep analysis is undertaken for two reasons. We haven't even got to evaluation yet. And first, and before evaluation, very much in line with the theme of this conference, this analysis is undertaken um, to identify insights insights that can inform the future business and organization strategy. And I put this as the third stage of this particular model, which I'm calling the MAI model, M-A-I-E. Now, I'm talking here rather than simply, we're not just jumping in and reporting past achievements. Insights are always forward-looking. They, they're looking at the, creating the potential for value-adding initiatives by the organization. Whereas traditional evaluation findings are descriptive, insights are inferences, predictions, suggestions, recommendations. And I'm going to talk about, talk, come back to how hard it is to do this bit in a moment. But just as a few simple examples, insights might include things like identifying a gap left by competitors that you can see by studying data, an opportunity to seize thought leadership on an emerging issue, a likely legislative initiative based on patterns of political comment. I did that recently analyzing all the statements of leading cabinet ministers everything I could find, not from normal content analysis, but to see a pattern. They were setting the scene for a policy shift and were able to identify to the client long before the policy shift and say, this is probably going to happen. And that was invaluable to the organisation. It might be a mood swing among stakeholders that you can productively address at a very early stage rather than erupting into an issue management or crisis communication. This forward-looking approach designed to provide insights that contribute to future business or organization strategy also addresses two other obstacles that come up. I've mentioned three that I've talked about. One is this gap between PR outputs and organizational outcomes. To me, this helps because rather than trying to retrospectively sort of bolt PR outcomes onto the organization, this approach, allow, and which is a post hoc rationalization that doesn't often have credibility, this approach produces positive contributions into the organizational planning process. The second thing I think it does that's very useful is it actually addresses a troubling contradiction right at the heart of PR, and it came up again this morning. And that is that there is evidence that despite lots of demands for transparency and accountability, some employers won't pay for evaluation. And so I was intrigued by this, and Otis Baskin and a group of colleagues in Europe recently did a study that found this. And they gave some insights, and I did some further interviews, and it was really intriguing, because what it found is that most managers feel, senior managers feel either that they already have a pretty good understanding of what happened, or they feel what's done is done. It's over and finished. They don't want to pay for what they already know. They will pay for what they don't know. 
Now, the second purpose, of course, of this additional stage of in-depth analysis is evaluation. But what I'm doing is a positioning evaluation post the a deep analysis and the production of insights. And the effect of evaluation undertaken at this stage in the process should be obvious. Evaluation undertaken concurrently with or post insights is able to capture that value add, um, that value add provided to management in the insights, and it is therefore likely to reflect a much higher value or perception of value. Uh, similarly, insights that actually lead to change that might recognize external stakeholders' perspectives and lead to organizational improvements in communication is likely to lead to a higher perception of value at that level. Now, in the, in the, um, in the paper that I'll hand out, I'm very mindful that insights are so easy to say, isn't it? Oh, you need insights. And so a very troubling question I don't have time to go into today is how, how do you generate insights? And in the paper, I'll only mention a, show one table today, I have attempted to put down 10 or more specific things that high-level researchers do. You'll get this in the paper. Um, things like, first of all, having enough data, but qualitative and quantitative data. Use techniques like triangulation. Use data reduction and data display, not only for numbers, but for text. Break it down into word clouds, tag clouds, and so forth. Team analysis, using others, uh, peer review, uh, applying reflectivity. We tend to rush from metrics to evaluation. And I'm suggesting no, I'm take time, a little bit of time spent there can produce huge, huge results. Uh, I'll leave you to look at some of the, the, the paper that devotes several pages to talking about techniques that high level analysts in companies like Booz Allen Hamilton, KPMG use to get to insights. And there are a number of tools you can use. In conclusion, let me try and wrap up. I've, I've tried to sort of say that there are three barriers standing in our way that I don't think we've, we've adequately really addressed. First one is an overemphasis, by all means use data. But remember, data or metrics is not the end result. They're only tools. In fact, management don't care about the metrics. They actually care about what do you do with them? What do they tell me to do? So be careful in getting caught up in metrics and analytics. And remember, quantitative data, uh, we also need qualitative data. Uh, and we need insights from that. Remember the conflation of measurement and evaluation and think seriously about that, and I think they need to be torn apart, adding in much more analysis in the process. Remember the, the backwards-looking um, approach doesn't really make friends. We want to be looking forward, and it's all about insights, which is the theme of this conference. At any time I've presented insights to a client, there was not a problem about the next thing you did. They were actually asking you to do more. You agree? They, they practically beg you to do more of it. Um, four steps to up the game, and I am summing up wherever Barry is probably waving at me now. Um, I'm saying that the fourth, the thing is, to address these barriers, I've proposed a new model, uh, and I think even though it looks simple, it's quite a, a significant shift, is that measurement and evaluation must involve the collection of an analysis of qualitative as well as quantitative data because we're dealing with human perceptions, feelings, attitudes, relationships, and so forth. The, uh, what I'm calling the MAE model identifies measurement and evaluation as quite separate and distinct stages. Um, after measurement involving your data analysis, data collection and data analysis, the model proposes a much deeper stage of analysis going out to exogenous data, uh, which is often a, a missing link in this value chain. Thirdly, can't see the screen. Thirdly, a key purpose of measurement should be, in fact, I think the primary purpose of all research should be the insights that afford, that it affords to go forward. And it becomes a value adding process. Something that I constantly reminded of as a CEO has said to me, while ever you are producing outputs, you are a cost center, a cost center. It is only when you give me insights, you become a value center. Finally, do your evaluation, but do your evaluation post insights, post the application of insights, because at that time I find the perception of value, both internally and externally, is usually very, very high. Um, I'm happy to take some questions if there is time, uh, and as I said, the full printed paper is available, which I, I hope will uh, add to your thinking and uh, stimulate you onto new directions. Thank you. As I said earlier, Jim has put a lot of work into this. Uh, 
The full paper will be distributed um, during the uh, break, so we are copy on your um, chair when you, uh, when you come back. Um, and I'm already speculating how Chris Foster is going to follow some of that, but uh, Chris, that's, that's your worry. Um, so um, Jim is, is putting forward the M May model, M-A-I-E. You're the people in the room that uh, run uh, businesses uh, who would like to question or challenge Jim. Jim like, loves the challenge. Do I have a first question? At the back, please. Uh, first of all, I, um, I, think it, I, I think what you've said is brilliant. I've never heard it expressed quite so powerfully or succinctly, you know, uh, the, the need to really reinvigorate the humanistic side of what we do as, uh, as uh, measurement and strategy and insights people. So um, that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing, though, is in my world, uh, I find that the enemy is not very often the hyper-rationalization or, or, or too much quantification. I find, actually, the enemy is often uh, uh, a kind of um, gut-feeling approach to insights that is really detached, not just from numbers, which I agree it should be you know, separated from, and some, but, but actually from rationality. It, it, you know, that there is, there's the temptation to make insights what we wish were true rather than what is true. And, and I wonder how you propose in your model kind of combating that, which is really a kind of um, political question between clients and, and uh, clients and their agencies or within an agency between creative people and, and, um, and, and, and analysts. Uh, this, this temptation to call an insight something that feels like it should be true, even if you can't show that it is. Yeah, it's a, very, it's a very good point. And I just flick back to this diagram because one of the over, there's a whole range of tools and techniques on there. One of the overriding things, and academics have to do this, watch this as well, is avoid the rush to theorize. So that's an academic term, but it's, it's, it's forming conclusions too early. And we're human beings, and it happens with all of us. You start reading the data, and you're either reading onto it what you want to find, or you find a couple of things and you get all excited and you think, wow, I can knock this report over and get it to the client on time. Uh, it's a natural instinct. So what re researchers do is they apply deep levels of reflexivity where you look at yourself and you recognize you will do this. And so you say to yourself, my first but dozen conclusions are probably going to be crap. And I'm going to throw them out. And you do things like, uh, uh, refutability testing, where you actually work in a team and you get someone to disprove your early findings. These are the sort of techniques we use. So what you're saying is very true. We often rush to theorize to give those real quality insights. They are difficult to find and you've got to kind of dig them out and you've got to reflect and you've got to mull over them and chew them over in the weekend, have a lot of argument and avoid the rush to theorize. And that's why I was, didn't have time to talk about these today, but a lot of techniques like refutability testing, even when you come up with them, you say, OK, we've got these great insights. Now let's prove them wrong. And use all the same data and go back and see if you can refute them. If you can't, after a day's hard work, maybe they stand up. That's the kind of thing we've got to do as researchers. Jim, thank you. Thanks it's been back. our pleasure. Thank you.